Shalom, welcome back everyone. Folks hear me all right? Okay, wonderful. Welcome back for our third session of our six part class of uh, the basics of Jewish prayer. And I have to say this class is sponsored in part by the generosity of the D. Dan and Betty Kahn Foundation and also by viewers and prayers like you. So uh, if you feel moved, we invite uh, donations at our website, techia.org slash give. Okay, well, we'll get started with our uh, review. Okay, so uh, as our kind of warm-up question, we have a question about warm-ups. Um, so last week we talked about the structure of the service and focused on the first part of the service, the warm-up section. And so, if you remember, your homework was to find some warm-up prayers, uh, especially those that spoke to you. So I'd love to hear from, uh, you know, three or four folks about what were the warm-up prayers that you found and, uh, and what spoke to you about them. And uh, if you and for those of you who who didn't do the uh, the little homework assignment, if you're also invited to just uh, share a few words about what works for you in a prayer, what does it for you, what gets you in the prayerful mood. This is Robin. I can share. Um, I did not. I completely spaced on this homework but i did um attend services for the first this first time for a while that i turned attended non-high holiday services on friday um and it really was this class was so helpful we had just had our class on the structure and it was so helpful in terms of tracking us through you know feeling like less lost and more like i knew what was happening through the um service and i think in terms of like what works for me in prayer i'd say like having time to like get quiet and be present and bring intention because it's so easy to do it sort of rote or like just as a habit. But when it feels most meaningful is when I can really bring my full self to it. And usually that means a little bit more time and time to like fully breathe. Right on. Thank you, Robin. So sort of like the, uh, you know, what we mentioned about how the holy ones of old would, uh, would prepare themselves for an hour before prayer and then spend an hour praying. So 
having that time to breathe, to get centered, to prepare, that's great. Anyone else want to share about um, things that work for them to warm them up for prayer? I see Shell put in the chat that it's the uh, it's the community gathering that triggers the connection to prayer, which is uh, really powerful. Yeah, Jewish uh, tradition. You know, we of course individual prayer is a thing, but uh, the the communal practice of prayer is is really uh, a central religious practice of the Jewish tradition. And there's a reason for that, that, that we can kind of help each other to, to turn on and, and plug in. Other folks wanna share? Yeah, Raz, go for it. Well, <clears throat> um, for me, it's also the community uh, sharing, of course, uh, the gathering but uh, also uh, because I love to sing, um, the, um, the, the warm-up prayers or any of them for that matter, uh, that are lively and others that are uh, more solemn, the sort of um, back and forth between these two kinds um, is meaningful to me, um, uh, just as, you know, just essentially, uh, sort of in keeping with the way life is, um, upbeat and then also sometimes more solemn and um, more contemplative. Beautiful, thank you. And I, I see some folks uh, in the chat also resonating with that uh, note about song, music, mm -hmm. uh, getting attuned to the prayer. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's certainly a, a bit of why I like to start each session with a nigun, with a wordless melody, to uh, kind of help us get into the right headspace for discussing these things. Cool. Anyone else want to share? We, we've got time for maybe one or maybe two other people. Yeah, Seema. I'm, I'm trying to... Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, oh. I, it, it's the wordless tune, and I was that I that really gets I, I gets me in the mood. And I was just reading something about the origins of the Gregorian chant, and the reason for it was exactly the same thing to get the idea of the the chant was to get people in that kind of mood. Um, and a lot of our music really emanates from old Gregorian chants, so. It's, it is a, um, a mood enhancer and, and get people ready for being in a contemplative, prayerful, intentional way. Thank you, Seema. Yeah, there's, a, you know, you can find all these studies of uh, brainwave activity of various religious practitioners doing their practice. Um, oftentimes they'll take like a Buddhist monk meditating and maybe a Tibetan Buddhist chanting or something and uh, Gregorian monk uh, chanting and other things. And, you know, you can look at the neural activity and uh, chanting is actually said to uh, result in, in the theta brain waves that are associated with kind of uh, deep concentration, but sort of contentless concentration where you're, you're in the zone, but you're, you're not in you're not engaged with any particular details. So you're also receptive to many uh, uh, different phenomena. Very cool. Did anyone, uh, anyone got any liturgy favorites that there are uh, any, any bits of uh, structured prayer that, that help to you to connect? Yeah, Seema. Well, I just wanted to say, um, since I was little, I've always loved the Mode Ani, and I get so excited when you sing it, when you do the family or Shabbat, um, because um, that was something I learned to say when I was very young. It was the very first prayer, Mode Ani, and, um, and, you know, and I often, I think it through in the mornings as I get up. So it's just a, an awakening thing. Grateful to be here. And I always sing it to my grandson, Oliver, when we FaceTime. He's come to learn it a little bit, which is nice. 
Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I will. Um, I'll make sure to send out some uh, resources about Mode Ani. I think that's a beautiful uh, practice. It's just a little bite sized prayer. Okay. It's kind of one sentence or maybe one and a half sentences or three quarters of a sentence or something. Um, and so uh, that can be said upon arising each day, not just on Shabbat. Um, and so I'll send out some resources for that about uh, practicing that prayer which I think can really be a gateway prayer uh, to, uh, to building a prayer practice. Okay. Well, uh, we are on week three, believe it or not. And so uh, we've talked a bit about the blessings formula and sort of prayer 101. Uh, we've gotten to understand sort of the overarching structure of the service. And now we're going to delve into some of the content of the service, um, starting with Part two, we um, we had uh, last week sort of touched on the warm up, and so this week we're going to go from the warm up to the Shema and and that which goes along with it. Um, now, just a couple of things before we um, before we continue, um, I know that next week, next Thursday, is the uh, the holiday known as Thanksgiving, and so. Uh, a lot of folks may be busy on Wednesday night. And so I'm going to suggest, and I will move uh, to do this, that uh, rather than having class on Wednesday night, we're going to meet at a special uh, time Sunday evening uh, at 7 p.m. So the same time, we'll do Sunday evening instead of Wednesday. Um, and, and you will get an email to remind you about that. Um, but I just want to make sure it gets on people's radars. And um, yeah, and then so next week we'll be covering the Amidah for the next two weeks. And then finally, uh, for our closing session, we'll be doing kind of a smattering. Um, no, this is not the first night of Hanukkah, but uh, the, the Sunday, the 21st, this coming Sunday. Okay, great. All righty. Um, so tonight's focus, of course, is on the Shema. Yes, still at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, this coming Sunday, the 21st. Okay. So tonight we'll be focusing on the Shema. This is what we covered last week as just a reminder, three main services, Shacharit, Mincha, and Mariv. Here's a reminder of the structure. We're going into part two, Shema. Okay, so the Shema is uh, quite important. The Shema is actually the first thing that is mentioned in the Mishnah. The Mishnah, as you may or may not know, is a uh, collection, a codification of the oral Torah. So it's said with Jewish tradition that when uh, when God gave Moses the Torah at Mount Sinai, there was a written Torah that Moses written down, wrote down and uh, an oral Torah that was passed from Moses' lips to Joshua and from Joshua to the people of the great assembly and from the people of the great assembly down unto the rabbis. And there was an oral tradition of uh, basically how to be Jewish, how to do Judaism was uh, recorded in the oral law around the year 200 of the Common Era, uh, a guy named uh, Judah Hanasi, Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the Prince, um, realizes that, ah, if we don't write this down, these chains of transmission will get ruptured. And so he goes around and goes to everyone, all of these rabbis who know various traditions, and he collects them and codifies them in something called the Mishnah. The first part of the first part of the first part of the Mishnah, uh, the, the, the part known as brachot, for blessings, is about the Shema. And we've kind of touched on this a little bit, um, that this is the example that I think I used in the first session about uh, a concern related to keva. 
that it's not so much about kavana, it's not so much about mindset, but it's about structure. And so the opening of the, uh, of the Mishnah begins with this question, from when can one recite Shema in the evening? So this goes to show that usually uh, when things are collected, usually the first things that people teach or learn are rather important. And so it's, uh, it's not insignificant that the Mishnah begins with the question of when can we say Shema? Because it matters. I'll leave it to, uh, to you all to plumb through the depths of Mishnah to, uh, to see what all of the various opinions are and the stories that come up for it. But suffice to say for now that the Shema is quite important to the rabbis. Okay, we'll do some fast facts on the Shema. All righty. So the Shema, so sh first of all, uh, Shema means listen or hear. Um, I'm surprised that I didn't put it in big translation here already, but we'll get to that. Shema uh, at its core refers to a six word phrase that can be thought of as kind of the central creed of Judaism or the central prayer in some ways. Um, but it's not a prayer that's asking for things. It's not a request. It's not even a thankfulness prayer. It's not about gratitude. Um, it's a declaration of unity. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Listen, Israel. Adonai is our God. Adonai is one. Um, so it's, it's uh, I guess in some ways it's similar to the Muslim Shahada. The, it's the declaration of faith. It's a you know, there's no God, but this God that we believe in. Um, so Shema means to listen. And uh, if you've been to some of our Tachiyah services, you know that sometimes we uh, explain that a better translation for Shema might be to pay attention because we know not everyone can listen. Uh, so when we do Shema in American Sign Language, we say Shema, pay attention uh, rather than listen. So uh, this central prayer in the Jewish tradition is said every day, morning and evening. So who remembers what the morning and evening services are called, but in their Hebrew names? You can, uh, you can unmute and, and give us the answer if you want. Shar, Sharit and Marav. Close, yeah, exactly. Shacharit, <laughs> Shacharit and Mariv. Thank you. Yeah, you, you had it, you know, pronunciation. doesn't not, not the most important thing. Um, Shacharit and Mariv, exactly. So the Shema, if you look in a Sidor, you'll see that the Shema features in Shacharit and Mariv. It's not a part of Mincha. So though we have our thrice daily prayer tradition, three services a day, it's not said in Mincha. We'll... Uh, we'll get a little clue about why this is when we look into the, the words of the Shema. Um, especially when we look into the, uh, the sort of first paragraph that follows the Shema, the Ve'ahavta. So we'll get into that. Um, but so it's said twice a day, it's in, it's in the morning and the evening services. Um, but there's also a practice that's called Kriyat Shema al Mita which means the recitation of the Shema in your bed, on your bed. It's the bedside Shema. So some people, uh, it's quite a common practice to say the Shema before you go to sleep. And again, we'll get a clue for why that is when we look at the words of the prayer itself. <clears throat> so there are three sections of the Shema, and these uh, consist of selections of biblical verses. The, uh, the Shema is also uh, preceded and followed by blessings. And so this chunk of the service that I've just called, you know, part two, Shema, uh, is in Sidurim, in prayer books, uh, often listed as Shema Uvircha Techa, the Shema and her blessings. We could say it's blessings, but there's no uh, gender neutral 
a pronoun, third person pronoun like that in Hebrew. So it's, you know, the Shema and her blessings. The, uh, the Shema is preceded by the Baruch Hu. So we talked a little bit about how uh, praying in community can, uh, can help us to get in the mood, help to carry our prayers, help to uh, connect with the spirit of prayer. So the, the Shema Uvir Hateha, Shema and her blessings, uh, begin with an introduction, the Baruch Hu, which means let us bless, the call to prayer. We will cover that tonight. We'll talk about that and we'll learn uh, not only the words, but also the choreography of it. Um, and the Baruch Hu is said only when praying with a minyan, only when praying with a minyan, which is a group of, of 10 Jews. Um, customs of the Shema. Before the Shema is said, it's customary to gather your tzitzit together. You may not be wearing tzitzit. That's okay. Uh, so, but if you're wearing tzitzit, it's customary to gather the fringes together. Um, it's also traditionally said seated. Uh, interestingly, historically, Reform Judaism, especially sort of classical reform, classic high reform Judaism, uh, stands for the Shema. Because for the classical reformers, this declaration of the unity of God was precisely the centerpiece of their view of what Judaism was, which was sort of an ethical monotheistic tradition. So rather than um, rather than centering on the Amidah, which is all about prayers, requests, uh, including requests for a return of the ancient temple sacrifices and things like that. The early reformers said, no, no, the Shema is the centerpiece. And uh, so classic reform stands. Uh, outside of that, most communities sit for Shema, but you may find uh, different customs in, that, that you may encounter and a very popular custom for Shema is to cover one's eyes. And the idea behind this is to help you concentrate. Um, there are different ways of doing this, as you can see in the pictures. Um, some communities, some people have the custom of specifically using their right hand. Uh, right in, in Kabbalah, in the, in the Jewish mystical tradition, is the aspect of chesed, of loving kindness. And so there's a special, uh, you know, connection that you're, you're uh, sort of leaning towards that, that favorable side of mercy and kindness rather than harshness and judgment. Um, and uh, you can also see in the other, uh, the other picture there, a, uh, what I think is a Sephardic or Mizrahi Kabbal and I think Kabbalistic custom of covering your eyes, not like this, with your hand just over it, but in this interesting way where you use your, your, uh, your thumb and your pinky to cover your eyes, and then up on your forehead forms a shin. So the Hebrew letter shin, which can uh, signify the Shema, is also what often found on the, the coating of a mezuzah, of a, of a um, you know, a holy item that goes on our doorposts. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and so there are different customs for, um, for covering or closing your eyes for Shema. And I encourage y'all to, to do what works for you. Of course, um, you know, hearkening back to our note around uh, disability and deafness and uh, accessibility, uh, if we're doing the Shema in American Sign Language, that's not a language that really works to, uh, to communicate with one another uh, with eyes closed. So oftentimes when we do Shema in ASL, we have our eyes open. But, you know, we're uh, not a dogmatic community and, and we admit a variety of practices. So any, uh, before we get into the, the real content of the Shema, any kind of quick questions on these fast facts or other items? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Great. Well, as always, uh, if you um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll certainly have more time for questions and discussing. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point out was that if you look at the top right of your screen, and you'll see the Hebrew calligraphy of the Shema, the six words of the Shema, you may notice that the uh, if you start on the right side, because Hebrew is read from right to left, uh, the third letter in is an ayin. And it's bigger than the other letters. It's a little fatter, it's a little bigger. And if you look on the, the second line there, the final letter is a big dalit. It kind of looks like this, dalit. Uh, this is a scribal custom that uh, is in, I believe, in the Torah and as well in uh, Tefillin and uh, other uh, scribal uh, materials, that when the Shema is written, it's written with an enlarged ayin and an enlarged dalad, and that signifies the word ed, which means witness. And so we are uh, sort of reminded that when we are making this declaration, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, we are sort of making a testimony. We are being the witnesses of this truth. We're giving the truth. Okay. So here's just a little overview of, of Shema Uvir Hateha. We have Shema and its blessings. This is kind of the, the run of show for the Shema chunk of the service. We've got the Baruchu, if there's a minion. We've got a, a blessing called Yotzer Or, which is about uh, God in nature, God who fashions the, the great lights in heavens. There's a blessing, Ahava Rabba, or in the evening, Ahavat Olam. That's about, Ahava Rabba means great love. Uh, you may have heard the song that we sometimes sing, we are loved by an unending love. So that's our Ahava Rabba. And those two blessings, those two, two prayers, bring us into the Shema. The, the Shema, our, our step four, Shema Yisrael, is our six-word uh, declaration of unity. There's a portion that follows it, Baruch Shem Kavod Machuto Leolam Va'ed, which is said quietly. And then we have our biblical passages, the Ahavta, you shall love the Lord your God, the Hayaim Shemoa, and if you heed to these commandments, this is what will happen. You'll get rain and grain and all the good things, and if you don't do it, you'll get bad things and that kind of stuff. And then the third paragraph, uh, Vayomer Moshe, or Vayomer Adonai al Moshe, uh, uh, the, recounting how God spoke to Moses about the commandment of tzitzit, that you should wear them and not uh, that they should be a reminder so that you don't stray from the path. And then uh, the last portion of that, emet ve'yatsiv or emet ve'emunah, uh, true and righteous or true and uh, faithful, is sort of a litany of uh, basically how great and perfect God is that sort of revs you up spiritually for the next chunk of the service, which is the Amidah. So there's, a, there's a, a whole kind of sequence here. It's not just the Shema on its own, but the Shema is the core of it. Tonight, we'll just really be focusing on the Baruchu, the Shema, the Ruch Shem, and Ve'ahavta. And I would say that these elements are, um, these are the parts that, these are kind of the really need to know parts. Um, a lot of folks may not even know that there's other material that goes in between these things if they're used to, uh, to certain kinds of services. Okay, so let's get into it. The first element uh, that we'll address is the barhu. So like we said, the barhu is the call to prayer. So this is only said uh, in the presence of a minion. 
of 10 Jews. This is an invitation. There is part that the leader says and part that the congregation responds. A lot of Sidurim uh, explain what the protocol is about call and response. Uh, they may even explain how to bow. Unfortunately, not every Sidur explains all, all of this. So it's a good thing to learn. Uh, so there's many, uh, uh, many different melodies that one could do the Baruch Hu for. And uh, some of these are informed by the time of day that you're doing it, whether it's an evening or a morning service or just local customs. But you'll find um, if you've ever been called to the Torah for an aliyah, for a blessing before the Torah, this is the same, uh, the same thing that is said. The Baruch Hu is said as sort of the introduction to the, uh, the Torah aliyah. So the way that this works is that the leader chants the part in blue and the congregation responds in yellow. So it may sound something like this. Baruch Hu et Adonai HaMevorach. And the congregation would respond. Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Leolam Va'ed. After which the leader repeats that line again. Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Leolam Va'ed. That's your call to prayer. Now, it's not just something that is... Uh, sung, and then you're done. There's also choreography associated with it. There's also bowing. And so we are going to practice this. Um, so I think we can just go for it. So if folks want to, I'll invite folks to stand up if you wish. Um, you don't have to, of course. We often say rise in body or spirit. Um, and uh, sometimes it can be a little tricky if you're uh, trying to remain on camera. I think I'm actually going to do my bows seated to show how that can work. But so uh, Jewish bowing is a thing. Um, there, there are uh, extensive Talmudic explanations and halachic explanations about the kinds of bowing, how Jews are supposed to bow and how not supposed to bow. Really, at the end of the day, it comes down to a matter of custom. But the premise is that uh, you're going to bend the knees at Barhu, bend over at Et Adonai, and straighten back up for Hamvorach. And it's going to work pretty similarly for the second line as well. But let's try the first line. We'll try it together. I'll invite you to, to even uh, sing it with me to that same tune. You can remain muted, um, but we'll sing it to that same tune. So we're going to bend our knees at Barhu. Barhu et Adonai. Straighten back up at the end of the line. Hamevorach. All right, y'all looked pretty good. And then. Uh, it will work pretty similarly for Baruch. This time, we're going to uh, bend our knees. We're going to bend over at Baruch Adonai. And then we'll straighten back up at Va'ed. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Va'ed. Pretty good. You got it. Okay, so let's try it now. We're going to try with a real call and response. So I'll, I'll be our first uh, leader, and I'll invite everyone, to, everyone who's willing to come off mute. And it will sound a little uh, cacophonous just by the nature of Zoom, but it's, it's quite all right. So if folks want to come off mute and prepare yourselves for the barhu, we'll, we'll do a little uh, barhu dress rehearsal. So I'll be the leader here. Barhu et Adonai And you all say. 
ועם ברך לעולם ועד. I think we need to do that again, Jake. I guess we got our lines right. Yeah, that's right. So it's it's uh, leader says Baruch congregation responds with Baruch, and then the leader repeats Baruch and then that's it. So let's try it again. Uh, let's get a different leader. Who's feeling brave? Or who you can do it? Yeah, Rosemary, go for it. Baruch Ata Adonai Hambara. Baruch Adonai Hambara Leolam Ba'ed. Very good. Yeah. So, so it's uh, our first word is not Baruch, but Baruchu. Uh, so we're saying, let us bless. Baruch is blessed, and Baruch is let us bless. Okay, can we get another uh, volunteer? Baruch et Adonai Hamvorach. Yeah, Sarah, go for it. All right. Baruch et Adonai Hamvorach. Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Ba'ed. Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Ba'ed. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. Should we get one more? Uh, someone else want to give it a whirl? Okay. Y'all seem to y'all seem to get it so far. I will just. Uh, teach one more tune for it, which I think Rosemary also gave us a preview for. That's a traditional tune for uh, the Baruch when it comes to a Torah Aliyah, which is Baruch et Adonai Hamborach, to which the congregation responds, Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Ba'ed. So that's another version of it. Y'all want to practice that? Let's, let's practice that. It's done with... Uh, it's done with the same bowing, actually, so that when you, uh, not everyone does this when they go up for a Torah Aliyah, right. but uh, you are invited to do so if, you, uh, if you're up there for an Aliyah, um, that, that uh, you can bow along. You can actually do it. So uh, we'll try it again. So remember, we bend the knees at Baruch Hu and then bend over at, at Adonai and straighten back up the final line. And for Baruch, we do the same, bend the knees at Baruch, bow for Adonai, straighten up at the final line. Okay, so we'll try this. This is kind of the Torah Aliyah tune. Baruch et Adonai Hamborach. And you all say? Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Va'ed. Very good. And I say, Baruch Adonai Hambarach Leolam Va'ed. And then if I were to keep going, I would do the blessing for the Torah. And it follows this very same tune. da 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 And then everyone says, Amen. That's for another. We'll, we'll revisit that at, at the final session. But here's our Baruch Hu. So, wonderful. Yes, Y'all are doing great. Yeah, any questions? Yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Um, can you, what is the significance of the bowing choreography like on those words and like why basically is my question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So that reminds me that we should look at the translation at the bottom of the screen here, which says, Baruch et Adonai Hamborach, which means bless. It really means let us bless or you all bless. We all bless. Et Adonai, God Adonai, Hamvorach. And if you look in inside the word Hamvorach, you have the same root. Baruchu, Vorach, it's the same. So we're saying, bless God, the blessed one. And then the congregation responds, okay, blessed is God, Baruch Adonai, Hamvorach, the blessed one, Leolam Va'ed, forever. Now, uh, I bring this up because the uh, so we have to think about what's the meaning here is that we're trying to uh, we're trying to bless God 
we're trying to give praise, we're trying to uh, uh, show our, our dedication, our faithfulness, that kind of thing. And uh, one of the sort of folk etymologies for the word bracha is that it comes from the word berech, which means knee. And so, uh, like the body part, knee. And so, uh, so there's this connection then that, that kneeling, stooping low, something like that, um, it is connected with how we show uh, honor to the divine. And so uh, I'm not quite sure of the particularities of how this developed or, you know, why do we bend on Barhu? To me, it's sort of this intuit. I would say intuitively, we bend on Barhu to say, okay, let us bless. We're starting this thing, you know? So it's not uh, so it's not one of these situations where we say the blessing and then we do it. It's where it's happening simultaneously. That's my thinking about it. Yeah, I Sarah. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I was just thinking about other traditions and like in the Buddhist tradition, you know, you, you do prostrations and a lot, you know, in Islam. I mean, a lot of it's really interesting that a lot of a lot of people in religion, you know, feel that it seems like an intuitive thing to bow to. Um, yeah, but I was going to say, though, that um, I was going to wonder about the minion thing, like, so if you're alone at home sitting just in the morning prayer, you're trying to do your morning prayers and you want to say the, uh, you want to say the Shema, but you, then there's no preparation for that. Can you just go ahead and say it or you just don't say the Shema if there's no minion or what's the story there? That's a great point. So the, um, it's only the Barhu of this section, it's only the Barhu itself that is uh that requires the minyan so uh so if you're praying alone you would skip the barhu um but you would say yotzer or you would if if those are part of your practice you'd say the blessings that precede the shema um and you would say the shema you'd say the blessings that follow it's only this little chunk the barhu that requires the minyan and there are other parts of the service that uh are altered or changed uh, depending on the uh, if you have a minion or not. Most notably, that that kaddish is not said without a minion. Um, yeah, but it's just the it's just this call to prayer, and that kind of makes sense because it's this call and response thing that happens in a group, and so uh, so it's it's you know you you might say the barhu by yourself, but then who's gonna do the response? Okay. Anyone uh, else want to, uh, uh, any, any other questions before you move on? I have a yeah, strange Victoria. question. Oh, uh, go for it, Rosemary. And then I see Victoria's hand is up. Uh, so when you explain like why we kind of like bow, it made me think of how in the Torah, in like the translation, it says that when they bow kind of, they say uh, they fell on their face. Are they related or no? Yes. Um, so there are definitely biblical instances of, of where these uh, various biblical figures fall on your face in, in prayer or supplication. Um, they are related. There's also um, interesting, uh, as I mentioned, how there's kind of extensive discussion about like how, how are Jews supposed to bow and not supposed to bow. There are customs that, um, interestingly, it seems that my understanding is that uh, prostration was quite prominent as a Jewish practice um, prior to the rise of Islam, and that following uh, the rise and, and development of Islam, um, uh, Jewish bowing uh, sort of rejected the, the full prostration on the ground. Um, as a way of differentiating itself from from uh, Muslim practice. Um, and so there's that kind of uh, contraindication that comes from Jewish tradition. And there's another thing about how um, you're not supposed to f fully prostrate on a uh, on a stone floor or something like that um, because it's it uh, it, it um, what's the word? Uh, it looks like uh, idolatrous practice or something like that. So 
Um, so I would say that the, the custom of, of bowing in prayer is, you know, inevitably connected with uh, biblical figures, practices, but uh, it's not a direct connection. It's not um, a direct thing. There, there is a separate tradition of people who fall on their face in prayer, um, including a prayer called Tachanun, which is, I think, really only maintained in Orthodox settings of a weekday prayer where you do what's called, I believe, uh, nefilat apayim, where you, you pray uh, with your, your head in the kind of crook of your elbow. So as a, as a sort of uh, prayer of repentance. Yeah, Victoria, did you have a question also? Yes, Jake, uh, simple enough, working on my pronunciation. Uh, the second line, the response, pronounce the first word, please. Baruch. Baruch. So it has the roof. Yes. So this, uh, in this Sidor, this is the Reconstructionist Sidor, they choose to transliterate our Chet sound as, um, I'm sorry, a Chaf sound as a, uh, an H with a dot under it to signify the Ch. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's, that's a, a, a stylistic transliteration choice on their part. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Va'ed. Okay. Well, shall we move on to the Shema itself? All right. So here we are with full translation. We're going to take it word by word. So I already told you, we already talked about Shema means here, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Um, I'll just demonstrate quickly our, our uh, ASL version, which is Shema, pay attention. For Yisrael, we say the Jewish people, because when we're talking about Israel, we're not talking about the, the current nation state of Israel, we're talking about the Jewish people. Um, so this is a sign for Jewish, believe it or not. And uh, this is people. And then we say Adonai, God, is ours. Bring it across our chest. God is one. Okay, so that's our, that's our ASL translation. Uh, which I think helps to kind of uh, understand some of the flavors, the various vectors and angles of, of this prayer. So we'll take it word by word once more. And um, many communities, increasing an increasing amount of communities have the practice of saying Shema and giving a full elongated breath for every word of the Shema, bringing uh, intense concentration to each word, elongating it. Um, this practice, I think, was especially popularized by the Jewish renewal movement, um, but has uh, traditional antecedents in that it said that uh, whoever elongates the Echad and gives a firm pronunciation for the D, the Dalid, uh, you know, receives some share of merit in the world to come or something like that. I'll find the, the exact uh, citation for us. But so uh, we often use this practice of, um, of elongating the words uh, for concentration. And I'll say that uh, in terms of the meaning of what's going on here, there's a couple different levels of it. One, of course, is that there's a, a sort of basic statement of faith level. Listen, Israel, the Lord is Adonai is, is God. So Adonai is the more proper name. Uh, it, it is the stand-in name for the four-letter name of God, Yud, He, Vav, He, the so-called tetragrammaton that gets uh, anglicized as Jehovah or that scholars call Yahweh, neither of which are, are uh, terms that Jews use when they're talking to God, um, or not, not so much at least. 
Um, so there's a basic level of it that's the, the basic statement of faith to say that our God is Adonai. And, and, and our God is Adonai alone. Or to say that Adonai is one, meaning we believe in one God. We're monotheists, that kind of thing. On a, uh, on a deeper level, the Kabbalists, the Jewish mystical tradition, believes that this is not just an expression of a statement of faith, but that there's actually, in saying the Shema, we are actually uh, conducting a performative utterance to make it so that God will be one. So Kabbalistic tradition has ideas about how you know, in the beginning, everything was, everything was God. And then there was rupture. And our task in the world is to, uh, to do things, to do mitzvahs, to do holy actions, to, uh, to help sort of repair the world. This is uh, one source from where the term tikkun olam, the repair of the world, comes from. Um, to, to make to return the world to its uh, kind of primordial divine unity. And in saying the words of the Shema with the proper concentration, we are not just describing that God is one, but we are effecting that unity. We are prescribing it. Um, our very words enact this action. And so that's part of why there's a, a call to be intensely uh, uh, focused when saying these words. Okay, let's practice uh, saying them. We'll just kind of intone them uh, according to a very old traditional melody that may be familiar to some of you. But we'll do, uh, we'll just do the, uh, not a full, full breath for each of them, but just for the sake of demonstration, we'll, we'll show this tune. And so I invite you to cover your eyes and practice. Uh, let me rephrase that. For those of you who can uh, say Shema while covering your eyes, because you know the words by heart, go for it. For those of you who want to refer to the words on the screen, go for it. It's all good. So we'll, we'll just practice saying Shema now. I usually like to take a deep breath. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai So two things that I want to point out about Shema is that the custom of elongating each word and taking a breath in between helps to uh, make sure that your words are not slurred into one another. There's a halacha about that. There's a Jewish law a, a prescription about that, that you shouldn't, uh, you know, you shouldn't be saying Adonai Yechad with a Ya in between it, you know. Your words shouldn't be joined together. They should be distinctive. So breathing in between helps that. And then one other thing I want to point out, just from a little uh, spiritual perspective that I like to focus on is that I think that all of the vowels are contained in Shema. So we have our E, A, I, A, E, A, O, I, E, O, E, U, a, o, I, e, a. So we're getting a lot of a lot of breath going on, a lot of spaciousness. And I really want to invite you, uh, when it comes to practicing Shema yourself, to really try to cultivate that spacious breath of uh, and, and letting it really resonate. Um, especially if you're in a situation where 
you know, you have some time where no one else is home or you have some privacy or something, really go for a really profound Shema and, uh, and see what it does for you. Okay. So after we hit our Dalid, we say Echad. There's another section of the Shema, another six word section that is said on an undertone, in, in an undertone, uh, sort of a hushed voice, except on Yom Kippur, which is this phrase, Baruch Shem Kevod Machuto Leolam Va'ed. You may find some communities say this out loud all year round, um, and that is a practice that, that some communities do. Um, the sort of established broad tradition is, is uh, to, uh, to say these words in an undertone. So we sort of whisper, Baruch Shem Kavod Machuto Le'olam Va'ed. And this is uh, a, uh, a biblical, the Shema and the Baruch Shem both come from, from uh, bits of the Bible. And, um, and the Baruch Shem, I've heard a teaching that says that this is actually a prayer that, that comes from angels. And that the angels say, Baruch Shem Kavod Machuto Le'olam Va'ed. And, uh, you know, it's kind of improper for humans to say, except on Yom Kippur, which is a day during which we are akin to angels. And so for most of the year, we, we utter it in an undertone uh, because it's, you know, it's sort of like, I think of like the Greek myth of how Prometheus stole the fire. Like we sort of stole this prayer from on high somehow. And, uh, and so we sort of whisper it rather than, than pro proclaiming it out loud. But it means uh, Baruch Shem, blessed is the name, Kevod Machuto, of the glorious kingdom, of his glorious kingdom. It's a, a gendered word, Machuto, uh, referring to God. Um, a feminine form would be, I think, Machu, uh, I'm not sure if in this form of Hebrew it would be Machuta. Um, I think it would be. Uh, le'olam va'ed, forever, forever and ever. So another kind of declaration of praise for God. And then from the Baruch Shem, we move into the third part of this chunk of Shema called Ve'ahavta. Before we get into Ve'ahavta, are there any uh, questions so far that, that should be answered? Yeah, Sarah. Okay. Well, could you could you please lead us? Could we just go through the whole thing with the Baruch Shem, just yeah, so absolutely. we can be ready for the next time that we're doing this? So, I mean, I I have heard this, but I I like that you said to do it at a, a whisper. So it would just be good to get the rhythm of it. Is that okay? Absolutely. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask one quick question? Um, sure. Is it customary to also keep your eyes covered for the Baruch Shem? That's a good question. Um, I would say so, yes. Yeah, I, I think so. Okay. Um, any other uh, questions or or uh, comments before we go into uh, practicing Shema? Oh, I see that uh, Shell is asking, isn't there an alternate tradition that says that Yisrael in, in, in Shema Yisrael is referring uh, not to just the Jewish people, but to the original Yisrael, who is uh, our patriarch Jacob, and the response is from, from someone else. Yeah, I think the tradition, I'll have to find it but I think that it's talking about there's some situation where uh, where um, either Jacob, it's Jacob and his sons. And um, I don't remember if they are saying, it might be that there's some instance where Jacob is doubting the faith of uh, his sons for one reason or another, and they come to him at, perhaps at his deathbed, I, if I'm remembering correctly, and they say, Shema Yisrael, listen Yisrael, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. 
And he, in gratitude, says, Oh, Baruch Shem Kavod Machoto Le'olam Ba'ed. So I'll, I'll find that, uh, that Midrash, I think it is, and, uh, and send it out. Okay, let's practice the Shema. We'll practice Shema and Baruch Shem. Okay. And I'll also say, just so you know, um, there is a custom to, especially I believe in praying alone, before saying Shema, to say the words, El Melech Ne'eman, which means uh, God, the true and enduring King. El Melech Ne'eman. So if, if uh, that may be a, a, um, a, a tool that you'll want to use, you know, if you're if you're on the go, if you're try, if you're just starting out, especially with a prayer practice, of this whole section, Shema Uvir Hateha, this chunk Shema is the most important part. So if you just so you may not have all those blessings beforehand as you're kind of on ramp, but you may still be able to pull out your, you know. Five seconds, take a breath and say El Melech Eman, and that gets you in the in the in the the right mode of concentration. So we'll say Shema. Shema. Yisrael. Which brings us into Vehavta. So I'm going to chant this according to its traditional melody, and then we're going to take it chunk by chunk, working through the words. Um, I attempted to do an interlinear transliteration. Um, but it will be a little confusing because the Hebrew is going this way and the English is going this way. So, um, but we'll see how it goes. So here's the, the traditional uh, melody of Vehavta, which is indeed the traditional melody of, of how the Torah is read. So this selection, this chunk comes right from the Torah. And if you're reading this bit of Torah, this would be the traditional melody uh, that you would use for it. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha bechol levavcha ubechol nafshecha ubechol meodecha vehayu hadvarim ha'ele asher anochi metzavcha hayom al levavcha v'shinanta ham levanecha v'diparta bam v'shiftecha bevetecha uvlechtecha v'derech. Ubshok Pecha Ubekumecha Ukshar Tamle Ot Alia Deka Vehayula Totafot Bain E Necha Uchtav Taham Almezuzot Betecha Uvisharecha Now that's the traditional melody, uh, traditional Torah cantillation for it. Um, and I would encourage you all. It's great if you can do it with the melody, um, but more importantly, practice saying these words. Um, that's kind of how I grew up with it, was uh, just almost as a chant. Ve'havta et Adonai Elohecha, v'chol levavecha, v'chol nafshecha, v'chol me'odecha, v'ayu hadvarim ha'ele asher anochi metzabecha hayom al levavecha, v'shinantam levanecha v'dibar tabam, v'shivtecha bevetecha, so 
uchtatam al muzuzot betecha uvisha recha. This is something that um, once you get practicing and practicing, you may come to memorize this, but I would, I would really encourage you all to uh, intentionally memorize this prayer, but take it slow. Take it slow in memorizing it so that you uh, build a sense of understanding of what the words mean. And that's what we'll do now. Um, any questions? Be, we're, we'll, we're about to go kind of phrase by phrase through the Vyahavta, but I'll ask, are there any questions now before we do that? Is the first part, the Vyahavta et Adonai Eloheha, uh, bold because of the word Adonai, or is there some type of special meaning behind it? Um, the type of special meaning is just that uh, you will see that when we start going through it word by word, I have the bold portion. Uh, the portion that we'll be discussing is bolded and highlighted. So that one was just left bold uh, accidentally. But good observation. Um, any questions before we get into it? All right. So our first chunk, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. So you can see that the words are highlighted in blue. Uh, we have our Hebrew on the right, our uh, transliteration on the left, and our translation on the bottom. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. You shall or you will love the Lord your God. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. You will love Adonai your God. Ahava is our Hebrew word for love. It's, you know, here's our simple commandment. You will love the Lord your God. Of course, Jewish tradition asks, what does that mean? How can we love God? There's plenty of uh, extrapolation that needs to go on there. But at least on the surface level, it, it's rather simple. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha Bechol levavecha uvechol nafshecha uvechol me'odecha so you will love with all of your heart. Bechol, the Hebrew word lev means heart. Bechol, and this is a, a weird form of la, lev, levav also means heart. But there's uh, some kinds of interpretations about why is it doubled. But bechol levavecha, with your whole heart, uvechol nafshecha, and your whole nefesh, which is your soul. Um, Jewish tradition says there's multiple levels of your soul. Nefesh is actually a kind that every being has a nefesh. Um, so animals and plants, and I think even rocks and stuff have a nefesh. It's just kind of your vital force. Uvechol, um, and with all of your me'odecha. This is a strange one um, that commentators have kind of seized upon for explaining differently. But the word uh, od means more, so with all of your more. Or the word me'od means very, so you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all of your soul and all of your very, all of your everything, which is kind of interpreted to mean everything you got, you know? So people say, a, a classic translation says all of your might, which I think is pretty good. Okay, we'll, we'll move on a little further before we uh, take some questions. Vehayu hadvarim ha'ele. And which means, uh, this is where the Hebrew and the English sort of uh, um, uh, don't quite align. Vehayu hadvarim ha'ele means, uh, and, and it will be these words, hadvarim ha'ele, you may have heard of a Devar Torah. It's a word of Torah. So Devarim Ha'ele, these words. Asher Anochi, that I, Mitzavvecha, Hayom Alevavecha, that I give, uh, that I command to you today, Hayom, Al Levavecha, on your Levav. So it will be on your heart. 
you'll note that a lot of these words, as we go through the Shema, we have a lot of this Echa, Echa. What's all this Echa? Your Levavecha, Nafshecha, Meodecha, Mitzavecha, Levavecha. This Echa suffix means your. So whenever there's an Echa here, that's referring to your uh, it's, le it's not just levav, it's not just a heart, but it's levavecha, your heart. Uh, we'll also see this, uh, in, it, it's also in the verb form, asher anochim mitzavecha, that I command to you. And this word mitz, mitzavecha is uh, related, the same root as the word mitzvah. A mitzvah a lot of people colloquially say, oh, a mitzvah is a good deed. Traditionally, a mitzvah is a commandment. It's a sacred obligation. So uh, this, this chunk, take to heart these instructions, these mitzvahs that I, that, that I command you today. Or take to heart these words with which I charge you this day. You know, poetic translation. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, we'll keep going. So take these commandments to heart that I command you today. Vishinantam levanecha. This, this means, and turn them over to your children. Vanecha, uh, you may have heard uh, some people's Hebrew names are so-and-so, Ben, so-and-so. They're, you know, Moshe, Ben, David, the Moses, the son of David, or something. So, Vanecha, your son, your Ben. Vishinantam, this is a cool word, turn them over. Vishinantam, pass them forth onto your children. Vidibarta, and speak them. Bam. Uh, to them, bishivtecha bivetecha. When you, uh, when you're sitting at home in your house in your bait, when you're when you're shuving in your bait, when you're sitting in your house, you should recite them. Uvlechtecha vaderech, and when you walk on the way. So you're supposed to say these words. You're not only supposed, they're, they're not only important that you love God with all your soul and all your might and all your veriness, uh, your, your heart, your soul, and, and your veriness. Um, but you should also teach these words to your children. Turn them over onto your children. Speak them to them uh, when you're sitting at your home and when you're walking on the way. So now we're getting into some of the, the, this is a bit of keva, a bit of when should we be saying this prayer? What are we supposed to do? When you lie down and when you get up. Now, who remembers how many times uh, the Shema is said? How many services does the Shema, is the Shema said? Yeah, I see Shell has got his fingers up. Twice a day, it, we've got our our evening and morning services, when you lie down and when you get up. Similarly, when you look at the creation story in Genesis, they say there was evening and morning a day. And so this is a bit of a liturgy that, that co corresponds to this Jewish idea that the day actually begins with sundown. And here, because it doesn't say you should say it when you uh, when you lie down and when you get up and when you eat your lunch. No, just when you lie down and when you get up. Now, now we're going to get into uh, a bit more about the custom, things that arise from Shema. Ukshartam leot al yadecha. You shall uh, connect them leot as a sign. Al yadecha on your arm. Now, 
What in the world could that mean? I know with Orthodox Jews, it means that you, when you, in the phylactery boxes, the tefillin, the shma's in it. Exactly. Yes. So uh, this little chunk of the shema and the next little chunk, vehayula totafot beine necha, and let them be totafot, which is kind of a word that people don't really know what it means. Um, so people say symbol between your eyes. Um, bind them as a sign upon your arm and let them be totafot between your eyes. When figuring out how to be Jewish, at some point, uh, scholars, rabbis, sages, uh, the people that we call chazal, chachamenu zichrona levracha, our sages, may their memories be for a blessing, decided, ah, this means that we should literally bind these words as a sign on our arm. And we should, we're going to put these very words in a scroll and put them on a box and wrap them up around our arm. Ukshartam laot al yadecha. And vehayula totafot beine necha. And we're going to let them be something in between our eyes. So we're going to have a box with the scrolls on our arm and a box with our scrolls on our forehead. Now raise your hand if you've uh, seen tefillin. Okay. Oh, great. Most people have seen tefillin. Raise your hand if you if you've uh, worn tefillin. Not so many. Yes. So uh, tefillin are largely the province of uh, of orthodoxy. Some conservative Jews, some Reconstructionists, uh, you know, other kinds of denominations, but for the most part. Tefillin are uh, a thing that Orthodox Jews wear, and that has to do with a lot of factors, one of which is that they're not worn on Shabbat. Tefillin are a weekday practice. And uh, the idea for this actually comes from this verse that uh, elsewhere in the Torah, Shabbat is described as a sign that God gives to the Jewish people. It's described as an ot, a sign. And, um, and here in, in the, the sort of the commandments to wear tefillin, ukshartam leot al yadecha, let these be a sign. Well, the rabbis figured, wait a minute, we're going to let these things be a sign and Shabbat is also a sign? No, on Shabbat, the Shabbat is the sign that we need. We don't wear tefillin on Shabbat. Um, I definitely encourage folks to, uh, if you have the opportunity, to try out wearing tefillin. They're, it's a very interesting experience. Um, they are unfortunately prohibitively expensive. Um, but um, they, it's, it's worth trying out. Um, if, you're, uh, if you look something like me, chances are you've been somewhere where they're are uh, Chabad people who say, are you Jewish? And they want to put tefillin on you. If you don't look like me, um, they may or may not want <laughs> to, to put tefillin on you um, because it's traditionally a, uh, a, a man's commandment. Um, although even in Orthodox settings, there is discussion and uh, disagreement about if is this something that women and people who aren't men can do but don't have to do, or is it something that they they shouldn't do? And there's lots of halachic Jewish legal uh, uh, questions about that, and um, and then also matters of custom and gender roles and things like that. So it's complicated, but um, worth noting as well that so we have ukshar tam laot al yadecha vehiula tatafod beine necha. I like to. Uh, to, at the, with these words, to touch my arm, where the tefillin would go, the inner part of your bicep, and my forehead. Whether or not I'm wearing tefillin. Um, as, a, as a way to kind of connect with the embodied component of the commandment. Um, and that's, uh, I, I think I've seen other people do that as well. It's not just my own innovation but uh, it's sort of an intuitive way of connecting with the prayer. Um, worth noting that there is uh, a group of Jews called Karaite Jews. K 
Karaite Jews are kind of a different um, branch of the Jewish family tree. What we practice is something called rabbinic Judaism, which means that, you know, after the destruction of the temple, there were all these rabbis and they developed something with the Mishnah and then the Talmud and extrapolate a legal tradition from there. Um, Karaite Jews are kind of a, a different branch of that tree that uh, don't hold by the same traditions um, and tend to be a lot more uh, focused on the, the text of the Torah itself rather than uh, later interpretation. They do have uh, interpretive traditions, but but their, their practices differ. Um, and my understanding is that Karaites read this word, read this bit of Torah, and they say, yeah, obviously this is a metaphor. We don't need to put boxes on our arms and head and stuff like that. But personally, I think it's very cool um, to, uh, to have to fill in. So this is where it comes from. And finally, our final uh, kind of verse or, or clause of the Shema of the Viahavta is Uch Tavtam al Mizuzot Betecha Uvi Sha'arecha. And write uh, on Mizuzot on your house and on your gates. So this is, uh, you kind of have to know what a Mezuzah is to understand, or you kind of have to make something up for what a Mezuzah is uh, in this context. But it's another instance where. We, say, we see that the, uh, the prayer itself is commanding us to do something with these words. And we're supposed to put these words on our uh, doorposts and upon our gates. And it's from this that we get the tradition of the mezuzah, which is a, uh, a little box that contains uh, scrolls of, of uh, Torah verse and, um, and is put on the gates of Jewish homes, the, the doorposts in Jewish homes. Um, some people have them just on their front door. Some people have them on every room except the bathroom. Some people, you know, have variations in between. And of course, a, a common custom with the mezuzah is to, uh, to kiss the mezuzah, to touch it or to touch it and kiss it. Um, in, in this day and age, I don't know if I want to be encouraging or discouraging. I'll just say, everyone be careful, be safe about your droplets and your uh, you know, spread of, of various diseases. But um, it's definitely a time-honored custom to, uh, to show a certain reverence to the mezuzah, to, uh, to touch it, to kiss it. Um, and yes, some people will actually put their lips right up on it. So that's something. Okay. So that's our Ve'ahavta, Uvisha Arecha, on your gates. So let's go through it. Let me chant it one more time, just to, to remind you of the melody. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll touch on the, uh, the paragraphs that follow the Shema, uh, that follow the Ve'ahavta. Okay, so we'll start up at the top right in the Hebrew, up at the top uh, left in the transliteration, or on the bottom left in the English, and you're welcome to follow along wherever. And actually, let's do the whole, we'll do the whole Shema with it. So you get the whole uh, flavor of the sequence, the whole feel of the sequence. So we might say quietly, El Melech Ne'eman, to prepare ourselves. And then we say Shema. Actually, I'll invite folks to come off mute if they'd like uh, to say Shema and Be'ahavta along with me. Okay. <coughs> Shema.
ואהבת את אדוני אלוהיך בכל לבבך ובכל נפשך ובכל מאותיך והיו הדברים האלה אשר אנוכי מצווך היום על לבביך ושיננתם לבניך ודיברת בם בשבתך בביתך ובלכתך בדרך ובשוכבך ובקומך וקשרתם לאות על ידיך והיו לתותפות בין עיניך וכתבתם על מזוזות ביתך ובהישרך All right, so we'll quickly just look at the English for these, uh, these prayers that follow, these paragraphs that follow. Again, the, uh, the Shema itself is the core of this section of the liturgy. If you only have time or attention for Shema, just say Shema. If you can also do Baruch uh, Shem and Ve'ahavta, do that. That's considered a, um, a um, substantive chunk. That sort of meets your obligation for saying Shema, as far as I understand it. And certainly uh, within our uh, fluid accepting Reconstructionist tradition, it's, it's uh, wonderful that you can make time for Shema and Ve'ahavta, whether or not you say the stuff before it or after it. But could I get a reader for uh, this, where it says paragraph two, just so we get a sense of, of what these latter paragraphs are about? I can read, Jake. Great, thanks, Victoria. And if you truly listen to my bidding, as I bid you now, loving the font of life, your God, and serving God with all your heart, with every breath, then I will give you rain upon your land in its appointed time, the early rain and the later rain, so that you may gather in your corn, your wine and oil. And I will give you grass upon your field to feed your animals and you will eat and be content. Beware then lest your heart be led astray and you go off and worship other gods and you submit to them so that the anger of the, old, of the mighty one should burn against you and seal up the heavens so no rain would fall so that the ground would not give forth her produce and you would be forced to leave the good land I am giving you. Do you want me to continue? Yeah, keep going. So place these words upon your heart into your life breath. Bind them as a sign upon your hand and let them rest before your eyes. Teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit at home and when you walk upon the road, when you lie down and when you rise inscribing them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that your days and your children's days may be many on the land the faithful one promised to give your ancestors as long as heaven rests above the earth. Great, thank you. So we see, uh, you know, we see some of the, uh, a word, almost word for word repetition uh, in, the, in that second paragraph there. Place the words upon your heart, Find them as a sign upon your hand, that all that stuff gets repeated. And we also get this interesting kind of uh, proto-ecological uh, viewpoint that says, uh, you know, if, if you, you know, are, are true and dedicated and, and wholehearted in your service, then God will uh, return your devotion with rain in its proper time and um, all, all the good things that are good for the produce of the earth. And um, we also see this theme of uh, being mindful so that we are not led astray. And that comes up in the, the paragraph about tzitzit. And I'll just note that uh, this vihaya im shamoa is the traditional uh, paragraph that follows the Shema. In the Reconstructionist Sidur, uh, they present a slightly different one as biblical, uh, biblical passage number one. And they say, okay, choose between these two. But I wanted to present the more traditional version um, so that you see there is this uh, traditional attitude of, of uh, 
the covenantal quality of relationship between the Jewish people and God, that we give praise and service, God gives uh, produce and, and good things and favorable conditions. Could someone read the, uh, the paragraph where it says paragraph three, tzitzit? I will. Thanks, Rosemary. The boundless one told Moses, speak to the Israelites, then to make themselves tzitzit upon the corners of their clothes throughout their generations, have them place upon the corner tzitzit a twine of royal blue. This is your tzitzit. Look at it and remember the mitzvot of the eternal one and then do them so you won't go after the lust of your heart or after what catches your eye so that you remember to do all of the mitzvot and be holy for your God. I am the faithful one, your God, who bought you from Mitzarim to be for you a God. I am the infinite, I am the infinite, your God. Great, thank you. So we see, uh, we see this is another uh, biblical selection, the commandment of tzitzit, fringes on the corners of your garments, um, which according to custom are tied in certain ways. Every four cornered garment you have should have tzitzit on it, um, not just your talus, according to the Bible. And you're supposed to put a special thread, a blue thread on there. And it's there, why? To help you remember to help you remember mitzvot, to help you remember your sacred obligations, your sacred path, to keep you on the right path so that you don't go straying onto all these other uh, delinquent things. Um, the custom is that, remember, we, we have our tzitzit gathered before the Shema. The custom is, is that whenever the words uh, tzitzit are mentioned in this paragraph, you give them a kiss. And you'll see that tzitzit are mentioned quite a lot. They say, this is the commandment of tzitzit. Make tzitzit. These are your tzitzit. So you're really uh, connecting with them. Um, one more thing is that the uh, we see the closing words there. I am Ani Adonai. I am uh, your God who brought you forth from Mitzrayim, from Egypt, to be your God. Um, tradition mandates that we are called to remember the exodus from Egypt every day. There's a, a number of uh, remembrances that we're supposed to do every day. And one of them is to remember that we were slaves in the land of Mitzrayim and that uh, God liberated us. And so this third paragraph of the Shema, part of why it's there and part of its function is to, um, to help us in that remembrance of uh, this great liberation, this great liber liberatory force of the divine, uh, which I think is, is quite beautiful, powerful, and um, an important practice, especially as we all work as, uh, as Jews with uh, progressive values and commitments. So your homework for tonight or for this week is to uh, practice the Shema and Be'ahavta. Let's say, can you do it 10 times until next week? Now, granted, this was written for when I was thinking that we would be meeting in a full week, but I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll still keep the 10 times as, as practice. So maybe you can do it twice a day uh, leading up to Sunday. And that will, that, I think that'll get you there. And if not, you can now throw in some extra practices. We're meeting on Sunday instead of Wednesday? Ah, uh, yes. So, yeah, okay. reminder that, that. Um, that's okay. Yes. So, we'll, our, uh, because of, uh, you know, people's busyness with uh, thanks taking and, uh, and things like that, rather than uh, meeting on Wednesday evening, we'll, we'll meet on Sunday, this coming Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern uh, for our next class, which will be on the Amidah. And so um, thank you all for another great night. I'm gonna stick around and answer some questions. Uh, I'll stop the recording, of course. And uh, I just wanna wish you all uh, a lot of koach strength. First of all, yashar koach, 
you should have straight power for your uh, for your prayer practices. It's really wonderful that that you're making this commitment, and uh, I'm so honored to be on this journey with you. So until next time, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.